Today I'm going to be talking about water-soluble graphite tips and what I learned doing this portrait of Davy Jones. <laughs> everyone, it's Jane from Southpaw Creative. So this is going to be a list of tips for water-soluble graphite as I did this particular portrait of Davy Jones the Monkeys, who was my childhood crush. And we're coming up on the five-year anniversary of his death, so I thought I would give tribute to him. And so what I did before I did this was I did a sketch of him from his screen test whenever he was auditioning for the monkeys. And if you haven't seen it on YouTube, it's absolutely adorable. He's like this big ray of sunshine and you just can't help but smile. And I felt like he had an infectious smile. So this was to be able to study the subject matter first before I did this big portrait of him. And um, because the idea seemed a little bit more intimidating. So getting to know my subject matter first with the features that I needed to know helped out a lot. Today I'll be using Duravon liquid pencils, specifically gray three, gray nine, and sepia. The Art Graph water soluble graphite tin. Lyra makes this amazing water soluble graphite crayon and they make it in different degrees, but I have the 9B and oh my gosh, whenever you use it and you put water on it, it just creates the deepest, richest shadows and I highly recommend it if you're using graphite work. I've got a bright brush, I believe it's number six, Royal and Lang Nickel. I've got a filbert brush and a flat brush in two and a Cotman quadruple zero um, little itty bitty brush. I'm using the Winsor & Newton blending medium just here and there to smooth things out. Um, this is an awesome medium. The most awesome Tombow mono eraser. It is so awesome to get in those tight little spots and then use some uh, highlight lifting in the end. So before we get into the graphite tips, I'm only going to give you a couple seconds of what I did with his eyes. He had these beautiful brown eyes and I really wanted to just make them stand out amongst the rest of the piece. I really didn't know if I was going to be doing graphite at this point. I felt very, very kind of blocked and lost at first, but um, it, it turned out that the graphite was the best way to go. So I recorded it up close, which I can do a separate video on how to render eyes in water soluble media, but I just wanted to show you real quick exactly what I was doing with these eyes to kind of make them stand out and give you an idea of what I did. So the first thing, the first tip is to work light to dark and to dilute the graphite on a separate palette and just keep some paper towels and cloths nearby because I found myself um, overdoing it with some of the graphite and then I had to go back and blot it out. And this was with the tin and I believe it was at this time I, I tried to work in some red and that just didn't work. Uh, so I stuck with the, the gray scale mostly. And sometimes you just got to listen to what the art actually wants you to do. I know that sounds a little goofy, but it's true. I mean, it just some things work out better than others for different particular pieces of work. And I'm just kind of blocking in some color. I'm not really too, you know, too oriented with detail here at this point. And um, I think it's, you know, whenever you're working in water soluble graphite, especially with a portrait, I think it helps to kind of just work from the very lightest value to check your values. And that kind of leads into number two, the tip uh, that I have for number two, which is um, to study your subject and to check your values of light and midtones and shadows. And also really important is to be aware of actual light and deep shadows. There's a spectrum of shadows that works within every portrait and um, make sure that you check around the jaw lines and the way that the, the lighting direction is going and making sure that you have that full spectrum of shadows as you develop your work. So I started to use a darker gray, which was the gray nine on the liquid pencil. And it's an interesting medium because it kind of puts a marriage between watercolor and graphite and it has a beautiful finish to it. And I just diluted it where I needed to and lifted some color where I needed to as well because of course I make mistakes too. And I'm darkening in some of the corners of his mouth and just kind of adding some more value, checking back and forth like I do. Um, the difference between water soluble graphite and regular graphite is that with the water soluble graphite, you kind of have to work around a little bit instead of just obsessing over one particular part. And so that you have enough time for the uh, graphite to dry, which does dry faster than regular watercolor, just FYI for those of you who are watercolor artists out there. 
So by the way, fabric is not my favorite thing to render. <laughs> but tip number three is what I found is that layers are essential to start with the light areas and study the folds and study the reference photo with the folds. Um, I happen to run into some mistakes here, but I en ended up correcting them. So that tip, the fabric kind of all works together like an intricate map. So it's really, really easy to kind of get lost in it. So just make sure that you, you know, kind of go back to your reference photo and, um, you know, work light to dark. So here is tip number four. <laughs> I found that the bright brush, which was a number six, really worked well with creating texture in the straight hair. Once it's dry, you can kind of use a round brush or a filbert to create the fine texture, which you'll see later on. And you can also use the edge of the flat brush on a second layer too to kind of create the same effect if you don't have a filbert. I'm also using that bright brush um, in a vertical stroke, by the way, to create that texture. I actually had a blast doing this portrait. Maybe it's just because, um, you know, my love of the subject, but um, I also, it was just a very stress-free, mostly stress-free experience, which is always good. So for tip number five, um, what I found with blending the skin value that helps the most is to go between the filbert brushes and the bright brushes. So that really helped out a lot and, um, you know, blend to your liking until it resembles the photo. So here's a little another angle just for kicks and um, to, to give you a little bit more of an idea of what I was doing with the lips because sometimes that overhead um, shot sometimes doesn't quite give you the exact detail that you need to see. But uh, I struggled with his upper lip quite a bit <laughs> later on and it's one of those things that I couldn't leave well enough alone and I'm sure a lot of you artists do that too and can relate to that. So um, darkening the values back over again, layering and layering. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, too overzealous with those um, those midtones and shadows. I kind of I wait till the very end to add in the the nine B graphite usually until um, I get it to where I, I want it to be. And that's tip number six is to wait until the very end to add the darkest shadows because that will make your work pop at the end. And I I hate to describe it like that, make it pop, but you know it, it really does. It makes a huge difference. I see a lot of wonderful um, graphite artists and I see a lot of wonderful graphite work that just, in my opinion, I feel like in the shadows, they could have used just a little bit darker in certain areas to really make that huge contrast that really makes things um, more realistic and, and beautiful. Look at those eyebrows, man. Those are some eyebrows, just a, a quick glance at them. Um, definitely study the, the defining features of your subject matter. That'll come later on, which I'll talk about, but just kind of giving you a little bit of detail work there as to what was going on so far. So as we go into tip number seven, I was actually uh, lifting some parts here. And what I found for tip number seven, it's just, it's one of those things that I just sort of fell in love with it during this process was basically you use a damp brush to your advantage. So when you run out of water on your brush and it's just sort of damp or dry, you start filling in those areas that are, you know, not quite blended just yet because they're still kind of wet and you can go back over them. And you can also use this for smoothing and blending the already dried layer. So if it's just barely damp in that filbert brush, you'll be able to smooth out areas that didn't quite get too smooth once they dried. And so I actually use this quite a bit during um, the blending of his cheekbones and um, the values along his chin. Uh, that's, that's a really important area whenever you're working with portraits to be able to discern where um, the smoothing needs to go and where those midtones need to kind of gradually just sort of smooth themselves into the shadows. Unless you've got really, really high contrast, uh, this will work really well for you. At least I feel it will if you if you really work at it. Um, this is kind of a boring part of the portrait, <laughs> working with the folds. I know it's um, it's one of those things that's very essential. I'm just speeding it up um, to give you an idea that I did actually go back over and practice what I preach, which is you know kind of going into the shadows and into those um, crevices of the collar and darkening those areas and darkening the folds 
and really trying to pay attention. I was much more patient this time with the shirt than I probably ever have been with fabric. I don't know what it is. I just, I find fabric to be a very boring thing to render. And so... <laughs> I've given you all the advice that I can give on, um, you know, rendering a shirt. But I do feel bad because I, I whenever I um, did my transfer, I didn't realize he was wearing a beaded necklace. And so I totally forgot the beaded necklace. And I could have gone back over it, but I exhausted myself with this piece. What I'm going to do is tell you about tip eight. And that is really to study your subject. And, you know, make sure that your features are lined up. What I have found is if something is off, which I've encountered with some portraits, uh, what I do is I take my reference photo and then I take a ruler and I make sure that things are lined up. Like I'll draw lines on the reference photo and then I'll kind of compare them to my portrait. And it's it's really saved a lot of, of headaches that way. So, um, you know, if you make sure that your features are lined up that way, it really helps to kind of discern where things are not quite, you know, working. Because sometimes with portraits, you know, we'll almost be 100% there. And we'll say to ourselves, okay, something's off. And if we really stress out over it, it'll just cause us more of a headache than, you know, need be. So it could be something very simple, like, um, you know, if the eyes appear too, too close together, then, you know, you can sometimes just erase a little bit um, in between the eyebrows, which is what I did later on for this, for example. And, um, and, and it worked. So definitely make sure things are lined up and use a ruler for that. So what you just witnessed was tip number four, where I'm blending in uh, the hair texture with the bright brush on the edge vertically with that stroke. So I do practice what I preach, so. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you that. And let's see, so number nine is to use a small eraser to lift areas that are too dark or just need a strong highlight. Uh, this, this definitely helps because sometimes, um, especially with graphite, even water-soluble graphite, I have found that like sometimes the paper can kind of get dirty and you know things can kind of transfer a little bit here and there and uh, it might kind of dirty up your photo a little bit. And so, um, you know, that'll help you with that and it'll, it'll also make the highlights work really well and like I said before it'll make it pop. So <laughs> I can't think of any other way to describe it. That's that's just what we're going to settle on. So um, going right back over with these details once more and uh, working with that collarbone and the Adam's apple that was a challenge. Um, I'm not really used to I, it occurred to me I had really as many males as I've um, drawn I didn't ever really have to render a, an Adam's apple. It's very strange. So I'm just going back over and double checking some of the facial features making sure the ear is uh, darkened enough and um, so <laughs> it's my fancy setup right there. It's another angle where I was working on um, that neck area and so one of the things that I think is kind of an invaluable tip, and I hope I can get this across, is tip number 10, which is um, being able to discern when to be literal with the portrait and when not to be literal with the portrait, whenever you have to improvise. And um, what I mean is that, you know, draw what you see in areas that you see it needs to be drawn. But sometimes whenever we completely copy something, um, it doesn't end up looking the way that we um, want it to look on the portrait. So. One example is, is that Davy Jones had kind of a unibrow a little bit, and um, I actually went in with fine details with a, that itty bitty brush, the Cotman itty bitty brush that I had, and drew little hairs. But what happened was that actually made it look like his uh, eyes were very close set together. Even though it looked that way in the photo, it just didn't transfer that well. And so I had to go back over it and erase those little hairs and, and lift them out. So a good portrait artist, I feel, needs to know when to discern when it needs to be copied and whenever it needs to be improvised. So here's the background for the Daydream Believer video, which was a definitive song of his with the monkeys. And I wanted to make sure that I translated those colors in the same manner and uh, trying to get that, that blue was interesting. So what I did was I used Neo Color for the background, which you'll see me fill in. And it's very, very quick and it's very fast. So tip number 11 is probably one of the most important is to immerse yourself in your subject matter. Make sure that you listen to their music whenever you're, you know, using, um, you know, your talents to transfer that image of them. You know, it's a magical thing that happens. So if they're a musician, listen to their music, uh, watch interviews, 
you know, have it going on in the background. If they're an actor, watch some of their movies in the background, do it passively. It helps to actually channel um, that energy of them from, you know, the source of entertainment through you into the paper. And um, it's, it's a very ethereal thing that happens. So I hope that you have found this very useful, and um, this is my experience. Here's some details just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like up close. And I really enjoyed just really immersing myself in the old TV shows, The Monkeys, while I was drawing this and um, really studying the subject matter. And I really adore Davey, um, really miss him a lot. He's a very talented man, and uh, he was pretty much like, every girl's sweetheart from like age 50 down. So, <laughs> so I thought that this would be a lovely tribute because I really feel that we need to honor those that have brought joy into our lives. And he certainly did that for me whenever I was a child and now.